American voters consistently ranking the war in Iraq as their top issue towards the election, but we rarely hear from the Americans fighting that war. In our third story on the countdown tonight, voices from the front hit the front pages, and the military hits back with a hint of censorship. This month, with the U.S. death toll now at 101, our deadliest month there in almost two years, both Time and Newsweek are spotlighting the private messages, proud, anguished, frustrated, of two Marines. Time published one letter anonymously that reportedly is making the rounds among top Pentagon brass. Among its observations, I rarely see Ramadi in the news. We have as many attacks out here in the West as Baghdad, yet Baghdad has 7 million people. We have just 1.2 million. Per capita, Al Anbar province is the most violent place in Iraq by several orders of magnitude. And biggest outrage, practically anything said by talking heads on TV about the war in Iraq, their thoughts are consistently both grossly simplistic and politically slanted. Guess what? His biggest defender in that category was Bill O'Reilly. Meantime, today's issue of Newsweek, quoting from private emails of another Marine, Captain Robert Seychere, one of the 101 Americans who died in Iraq this month. Among his observations about Anbar province, whatever good is happening in Iraq isn't happening here. Even the Iraqi soldiers tell us that when America leaves, they'll quit. They trust us because they know Americans can take care of them, but they don't trust their government or the Ministry of Defense. And they especially don't trust their officers. Funny, he wrote, I feel the same way sometimes. Let me bring in one of the few Americans in regular contact with dozens of U.S. soldiers serving in Iraq, Paul Rykoff, who wrote about his own service in Iraq in Chasing Ghosts and is also founder and executive director of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Paul, thanks again for your time tonight. My pleasure, Keith. The Army now has a formal unit in place monitoring what the soldiers are saying in private blogs. What are they doing and what do we risk losing if military bloggers stop blogging or feel restrained in any way? Well, what they're intending to do is to try to maintain operational security. They want to make sure that soldiers serving in Iraq or Afghanistan aren't releasing confidential troop movements or vulnerabilities of weapon systems or other things that could compromise the safety of individual soldiers. You don't want Sergeant Smith accidentally telling his wife when his patrol is going to be leaving and where they're going to be going. What they're also going to do is clamp down on arguably the best information coming out of Iraq. The mainstream media, the politicians, they've been not, they haven't been getting the American people the real deal of what's happening on the ground. These blogs, in my opinion, are the most raw, the most accurate, and the most candid way you can understand what's really happening on the ground in Iraq. Turning to the emails focused or that the magazines focused on, and neither of these Marines offered a, a, an overall solution to Iraq. Is there a sense that even the men and the women who are serving there have trouble not merely coming up with a solution but believing that there is a solution? Well, I know, I know that they're frustrated, and they're not seeing progress just like the rest of the American population, but they also know that there's no silver bullet solution. If we stay, it's going to be bad. If we leave, it's going to be bad. The only people who seem to have a silver bullet solution or an answer to everything are politicians, and we know that that's just not the case. We're in a very tough situation. We're frustrated. The insurgency continues to evolve and develop, and, and politicians are more interested in attacking each other than attacking our nation's enemies. So I think a lot of people within the military are frustrated, and they want to see their own views represented. They want to see other soldiers speaking up and speaking out and educating the American people about what's really happening on the ground. Discussing uh, Marines who have been char charged with murder, uh, the late Captain Seychere wrote, uh, Bush should be ashamed of the predicament that this nation has been put in. War puts perfectly ordinary young men in situations that can't be judged by laws. This is what war does to normal young men. Is there, Paul, a catch-22 in trying to honor and support our troops without somehow acknowledging the worst things we've asked them to do in the name of our country? I hope that we can do both. You know, I was trained as an infantry, infantry soldier. What my job to do is to kill people and break their stuff. The American people have to understand that that's what soldiers do, and, and that's what we're trained to do, and that's what we're supposed to do. So you have to, at the same time, understand the magnitude of that. When you're asking a 19-year-old who's never left his state to operate in a combat environment where he doesn't speak the language, that has tremendous gravity, and the magnitude of it is something that I don't think most civilians can really understand. So I think we, we owe them the, the, the obligation of trying to put yourself in their shoes trying to understand the complexity and the dynamic nature of that environment before we pass judgment in either direction. Your group has ranked members of Congress based on whether their votes actually support the troops. Do the rankings match the public perception? Are the, the troops in the field aware of these rankings? They are aware of them, and, and the bottom line is no. There are a lot of people in Congress who are saying they support the troops, and their votes aren't matching up. Eighty-six members of Congress got a D or F grade uh, after our, 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 our opportunity to try to rank them all. And this is on issues like VA funding, uh, funding for health care for National Guardsmen and Reservists, a military death gratuity. People in the Senate actually voted against increasing the, the, the military death gratuity. This is something most Americans don't 
don't know about. It's in the details, and we wanted to provide a way for most Americans to find out who really supports the troops and who's just spouting empty rhetoric. I mentioned earlier the anonymous letter writers claim that the TV talking heads are, are grossly simplistic, politically slanted in discussing this war. What exactly is getting lost in the simplifications and in the political slanting? Just the breadth of it and the complexity. I mean, imagine trying to describe the death of your team leader in a, in a two-minute segment for CNN or for Fox or for MSNBC. It's just really tough to, to condense it all into a quick soundbite or into a segment for television. Uh, I think what we really need to do is dig deeper and understand that it is a complex environment. Even the embedded uh, reporters aren't giving you the full scope of what's happening on the ground. Uh, that's why we've been so vocal about trying to involve veterans in the discussion. We've heard enough from the policy wonks. We've heard enough from Rumsfeld, enough from the president. It's time to listen to the people who've been on the ground, because they are the subject matter experts. They're, they're not necessarily affiliated with either political party, and they want to continue to serve this country by trying to help them understand the most important issue facing it. Well, Paul, we may not know, but we always have a little better sense of what we don't know and need to when we, when we sit and chat. Paul Rykoff, author of Chasing Goats, uh, Ghosts, Executive Director of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Paul, thanks again. Thank you, Keith.